Good evening. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome all of you to the Hans Arnold Center uh, of the American Academy in Berlin. I'm Gerhard Kasper. I'm the president of the Academy at present, and I'm just extremely pleased that you are all here and that I may. Uh, that I see you here for the Ellen Maria Gorson Fellowship uh, lecture, le lecture. I should point out, though I will not point her out, I should point out that a granddaughter of uh, 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 John Arn uh, Hans Arnhold is with us tonight, and uh, the Arnhold Center obviously takes a lot of its vitality from having being so fortunate in being the, in the former villa of uh, the Arnholds. Now, under my own rules, I'm not permitted to introduce uh, tonight's lecturer. Uh, instead, I established a rule that said the lecturer should always be introduced by some professor or some other person from Berlin. And this very dignified gentleman, we are going to copy this arrangement. I think it is so much better than the usual to have somebody sit in this chair and look so terribly dignified as you do. <laughs> and uh, 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 it will be Professor Welmer who will uh, introduce uh, the speaker. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 indeed, uh, our speaker did ask, Moish did ask uh, Velma to do, do this job tonight. But I'm not permitted to introduce you, Moish. But uh, I spent 26 years of my life at the University of Chicago, and therefore I feel particularly close to any person who can claim a University of Chicago connection. Before I went to Stanford, Chicago was it. And though Moish was very careful, he came only towards the tail end of my Chicago existence. He was concerned that had he come earlier, he might have run into me, and we might have had conflicts, and so on. So he waited it out. Uh, but nevertheless, Moish, I'm so pleased to have you give this lecture tonight. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that under my rules, I cannot introduce you, otherwise I would have a field day. <laughs> uh, now, the uh, person who will introduce uh, uh, Moish Poston uh, is, uh, of course, uh, uh, Albrecht uh, Velma, uh, a retired professor from the Free University and uh, one of the most prominent German philosophers, uh, I may say. Uh, now, what is so very wonderful about Professor Velma's career is that he started out not studying philosophy, but studying mathematics and physics, and indeed uh, concluding those studies in Kiel in mathematics and physics uh, with the Staatsexamen, though in between he also did music, uh, studied music, I should say, for a while. But then he decided, now he had the appropriate background to start the study of philosophy. And he went to Frankfurt, to Heidelberg and Frankfurt, uh, 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 wrote his dissertation in, uh, in 1966 on Karl Popper and his uh, approach to uh, scholarship, to science, then uh, worked as an assistant at the famous uh, uh, University of Frankfurt and as an assistant to Jürgen Habermas. Uh, then uh, did his habilitation in Frankfurt. And uh, in later years, through Canada, he went to the New School for Social Research. He was a professor in Constance, again a professor at the New School for Social Research. And uh, he, uh, in 1990, I think, uh, went to Berlin. And uh, he is now a professor emeritus at the Free University. I should say that in, uh, I just asked uh, Professor Velma whether he was still working on music because one of his most recent publications, 2009, is uh, Versuch über Musik und Sprache. And uh, uh, I think this is so marvelous because it goes back 
all the way to his beginnings as a student in Kiel when he uh, also studied music. But he said to me that at present, uh, he has kind of given up on that. He's not any longer writing about the subject. That means, however, of course, he's still practicing. We are just delighted to have you here, yeah, and now it's your task. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for this uh, introduction of my role here. Uh, I hope you haven't set the uh, uh, example for the for my I mean for the kind of introduction I'm supposed to give, because my introduction will be completely different from what you did, uh, 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 and so I hope I, it's not a disappointment for you. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to for me to uh, <coughs> uh, introduce. Moish Postone, uh, uh, who will talk tonight about the uh, theme uh, of capitalism, temporality, and the crisis of labor. He is the, I'm sorry, I cannot see. He is the Thomas A. Donnelly Professor of Modern History and a member of the Center for Jewish Studies uh, at the University of Cor uh, Chicago, as well as a co-director of the Chicago Center of Modern or Contemporary Theater Theory. Uh, Moish Postone is one of the most important and productive representatives worldwide of what in Germany has been called a critical theory of society. There is a field of research which goes back to Karl Marx, critical analysis of capitalism, and which in Germany was represented, among others, by the major figures of the so-called Frankfurt School. Uh, Adorno, Horkheimer, Marcuse, Pollock, to mention a few of them, maybe the most important ones, and after the war, Jürgen Habermas. It is certainly no accident that Postone wrote his doctoral dissertation in uh, Frankfurt, the place where most of these people I mentioned have taught. Uh, he did not work with Habermas, whom I mentioned before, although he could have, who revents a version of critical theory which Postone has been critical of as much as he has been critical of traditional forms of Marxist theory. Uh, I should add that as for many figures of the old Frankfurt School, Postone's work on critical theory has been closely related to his studies on uh, antisemitism. It is now 50 years ago that I first met Moish in New York. At a time when I had one of my first teaching positions at the New School for Social Research, the University of Exile, uh, which had been founded during the 30s for philosophers and social scientists who had been exiled from Europe by the Nazis. Uh, after the war, younger Germans were generously invited uh, to teach at the New School. And during my stay at New York, Moish was one of a group of friends who shared my interest in critical theory not long after the peak of the student movements in, uh, in, in, in the 60s and 70s in Europe and the US. Uh, another one of these old friends from New York was Eike Gebhardt, who is also being here tonight and whom I also wish to welcome. After my return to Germany, Moish and I met again when Moish continued his studies at Frankfurt and I became one of the readers of his brilliant doctoral dissertation, a modified version of it which was translated in many languages, among them German, naturally, but there are also French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Romanian. Uh, and I think that 
the translation into Chinese and Romanian is still uh, going on. But Portuguese and Japanese, the, 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 the <coughs> dissertation has been tra translated into all these languages, uh, which already is a part of a highly impressive list of Post, post, post tones, publications, and interventions in many different languages. Already in his doctoral dissertation, uh, post tone has made visible again the enormous intellectual and political potential of Marx's work, which had been buried in a way through the various forms of its political vulgarization in the 20th century. Since it is lecture today, Postone, I think, will once more come back to what might be called one of the leitmotifs of his work. I am particularly cru curious <coughs> about where he has gone since the time I met him uh, as a doctoral student. For me, it is a great pleasure to meet Moish again after a long time, when we had not been much in, much in touch, because until very recently, critical theory had no longer been at the focus of my own interests. I think postpones present version of critical theory, I, I mean the version which is now going to present. Uh, uh, Given the explosive situation of the present world order, deserves our interest all the more. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Albrecht, for your very generous introduction. And thank you very much, Gerhard. Um, I'm privileged to be able to speak to you this evening at the American Academy as the Ellen Maria Gorison Fellow, named in honor of the family that has been so important for this remarkable institution. Uh, before I begin, I should make two apologies. One is that I've been battling a pretty miserable cold for a few days. I hope that it won't interfere with my presentation. And the other is that my talk is going to ask you to pay attention. Um, and even if you lose the thread, just keep on following. I think it will fall into place, I hope, by the end. The far-reaching transformations of the world in recent decades have dramatically indicated that critical social analysis must be centrally concerned with questions of historical dynamics and large-scale structural changes if it is to be adequate to our social universe. And I would argue these global historical developments can best be illuminated by a critical theory of capitalism understood not only as a system of exploitation, but mainly as a spatially and temporally dynamic form of social life that arose contingently in Western Europe, which it fundamentally transformed even as it also proceeded to transform and constitute the globe. That is, contrary to some widespread assumptions, this form of life is not intrinsically Western, but has itself reshape the West. It cannot therefore be adequately grasped in culturalist terms. <clears throat> 
Rather, I would suggest an adequate theory of this dynamic form of social life can best be developed on the basis of a renewed encounter with Marx's mature works. And Albert was right. Why bother rethinking Marx's analysis of capitalism at all? For many, the collapse of the Soviet Union and China's transformation marked the final end of socialism and of the theoretical relevance of Marx. This demise was also expressed on another level by the emergence of other kinds of theoretical approaches such as post-structuralism and deconstruction, which seemed to provide critiques of domination that avoided what were taken to be the deeply negative consequences of grand programs of human emancipation. The current global crisis, however, has dramatically revealed the fundamental limitations of such newer approaches as attempts to grasp the contemporary world and has exposed the one-sidedness of what had been termed the cultural turn in the humanities and the social sciences. The continued existence of severe economic crises as a feature of capitalist modernity, as well as the growth of inequality, the prevalence of mass poverty, structural exploitation on a global scale, and above all, the dual crisis of environmental degradation and the hollowing out of working society call into question the triumphalism both of neoliberalism and post-Marxism. It seems that the downfall of what was called actually existing socialism and the efflorescence of post-Marxist thought have not obviated the need for a critical theory of capitalism. Nevertheless, it would be a mistake to think that one can simply return to Marx as he generally was understood during much of the 20th century. Both the demise of traditional Marxism and the increasingly manifest inadequacies of much post-Marxism are rooted in historical developments that suggest the need to rethink as well as reappropriate Marx. My focus on the historically dynamic character of capitalist society is an attempt to respond to the massive global transformations of the past four decades. This period has been characterized by the unraveling of the post-World War II state-centered Fordist synthesis in the West, the collapse or fundamental transformation of party states and their command economies in the East, and the emergence of a neoliberal global capitalist order, which might in turn be undermined by the development of huge competing economic blocks. These developments, in turn, can be understood with reference to the overarching trajectory of state-centric capitalism in the 20th century. From its beginnings in World War I and the Russian Revolution, through its high point in the decades following World War II and its decline in the 1970s. What is significant about this trajectory is its global character. <coughs> it encompassed Western capitalist countries and communist countries, as well as colonized lands and decolonized countries. Although differences in historical development occurred, of course, from the vantage point of the 21st century, they appear more as different inflections of a common pattern than as fundamentally different developments. For example, just one, the welfare state was expanded in all Western industrial countries in the 25 years after the end of World War II, and then limited or partially dismantled in the 1970s. These general developments occurred regardless of which parties were in power and were paralleled by the post-war success and subsequent rapid decline of the Soviet Union and the far-going transformation of China. <laughs> 
Such general developments cannot convincingly be explained in contingent terms. They strongly suggest the existence of general structural constraints on political, social, and economic decisions, as well as of dynamic forces not fully subject to political control. At the same time, they call into question linear notions of historical development, whether Marxist, Weberian, or liberal. These general patterns also suggest that the theoretical focus on agency and contingency in recent decades was as one-sided as the structural functionalism it superseded. If the latter achieved widespread currency during the high tide of state-centric capitalism, the former has done so during the neoliberal epoch. Neither approach, however, thematized their own relation to their own historical context. This suggests that unlike such approaches, a critical theory should be able to problematize its own historical situatedness. That is, it should be reflexive. Consideration of these overarching patterns suggests the importance of a renewed encounter with Marx's critique of political economy for the problematic of historical dynamics and global structural change is, I would argue, at the very heart of that critique. Nevertheless, the history of the last century also suggests that an adequate critical theory, as I said, must differ fundamentally from traditional Marxist critiques of capitalism, by which I mean a general interpretive framework in which capitalism is understood essentially in terms of class relations that are rooted in private property and mediated by the market, and social domination is understood primarily in terms of class domination and exploitation. Within this basic framework, there's been a broad range of approaches that have generated powerful economic, political, social, historical, and cultural analyses. Nevertheless, the limitations of the overarching framework itself have become increasingly evident in light of 20th century historical developments. These developments include the non-emancipatory character of actually existing socialism, the history, the historical trajectory of its rise and decline, paralleling that of state interventionist capitalism, suggesting they were similarly located historically, the growing importance of scientific knowledge and advanced technology in production, which seemed to call into question the labor theory of value as commonly understood. Growing criticisms of technological progress and growth, which opposed the productivism of much Marxism. And the increased importance of non-class-based social identities. Together, they suggest that the traditional framework no longer can serve as a point of departure for an adequate critical theory. Consideration of the general historical pattern that have characterized the past century then call into question both traditional Marxism with its affirmation of labor and history, as well as post-structuralist understandings of history as essentially contingent. <clears throat> Nevertheless, such consideration doesn't necessarily negate the critical insight informing attempts to deal with history contingently, namely that if history is understood as the unfolding of an imminent necessity, it delineates a form of unfreedom. This form of unfreedom, I want to suggest, is the central object of Marx's critique of political economy. In his mature theory, history, understood as an imminently driven directional dynamic, 
is not a universal feature of human social life. Neither, however, is historical contingency. Rather, Marx grounds the historically dynamic character and structural changes of the modern world in imperatives and constraints that are historically specific to capitalist society. And the history that emerges can be and have been projected onto human social life in general. Far from viewing history affirmatively, Marx grounds this directional dynamic in his category of capital, thereby grasping it as a form of domination of heteronomy. His critique then is not undertaken from the standpoint of history and labor as in traditional Marxism. On the contrary, the historical dynamic of capitalism and the seemingly ontological centrality of labor have become the objects of Marx's critique. I'll elaborate on this. By the same token, Marx's mature theory no longer purports to be a transhistorically valid theory of history and social life, but is self-consciously historically specific and calls into question any approach that claims for itself universal transhistorical validity. It should be evident, I hope, that the critical thrust of Marx's analysis according to this reading is similar in some respects to post-structuralist approaches in as much as it entails a critique of a dialectical logic of history. However, whereas Marx treats such conceptions as expressing the reality of capitalist society, post-structuralist approaches deny their validity by insisting on the ontological primacy of contingency. From the point of view of Marx's critique of heteronymous history, any attempt to recover historical agency by insisting on contingency in ways that deny or obscure the dynamic form of domination characteristic of capital is ironically profoundly disempowering. I feel like um, there's a scene in, I think it's The Thin Man, where they just, except these aren't martinis. Don't <laughs> stir. <laughs> these contentions are based on a reading that reconsiders the most fundamental categories of Marx's mature critique with reference to the heteronymous dynamic that characterizes capitalism. Within the traditional framework, Marx's categories, value, commodity, surplus value, capital, have generally been taken as economic categories that affirm labor as a source of all social wealth and demonstrate the centrality of class-based exploitation in capitalism. Such interpretations attribute to Marx a transhistorical understanding of labor as a source of wealth in all societies. Within that framework, in capitalism, labor is hindered from becoming fully realized. Emancipation, then, is realized in a society where labor has openly emerged as a regulating principle of society. This notion, of course, is bound to that of socialism as the self-realization of the proletariat. Labor here provides the standpoint of the critique of capitalism. A close reading of Marx's mature critique of political economy, however, calls into question the presuppositions of the traditional interpretation. First of all, Marx explicitly states that his fundamental categories are historically specific. Even categories like money and labor, 
that appear transhistorical because of their abstract and general character are, and this is a little tricky, valid in their abstract generality only for capitalist society, according to Marx. Volume one of Capital is the rigorous elaboration of this analysis. It begins with the category, as many of you know, of commodity, which does not refer to commodities as they might exist in many different kinds of society, but is a word Marx uses as a structuring principle of capitalist society characterized by a historically specific dual character. The next few pages are going to be a little dense. <laughs> the dual character are use, value, and value. Marx sought to unfold the nature and underlying dynamic of capitalist modernity from this point of departure. At the heart of his analysis is the idea that labor in capitalism has a unique socially mediating function that is not intrinsic to laboring activity as such. That is, in a society in which the commodity is the basic structuring principle of the whole, labor and its products are not distributed socially by traditional norms or overt relations of power and domination, as is the case in other societies. Instead, labor itself constitutes a new form of interdependence where people don't consume what they produce, but where nevertheless their own labor or labor products quasi, uh, serve as quasi-objective means of obtaining the products of others. In serving as such a means, that is, labor doesn't just produce, but it's a means of distribution, Labor and its products, in effect, preempt that function on the part of manifest social relations. They mediate a new form of social interrelatedness. In Marx's mature works, then, as, I've, as I read it, the notion of the centrality of labor to social life is not a transhistorical proposition. It doesn't mean that material production is the most essential dimension of social life in general, rather it refers to the historically specific constitution by labor in capitalism of a form of social interrelatedness, of social mediation that fundamentally characterizes that society. So labor and capitalism is both labor as we commonsensically understand it, according to Marx, and is a historically specific socially mediating activity. Hence, what labor produces, its objectifications, are both concrete labor products and objectified forms of social relations. According to this analysis, then, the social relations that most basically characterize capitalist society are very different from the qualitatively specific overt social relations, such as kinship relations or relations of personal or direct domination that characterize non-capitalist societies. Because constituted by labor as a quasi-objective means, these relations have a peculiar quasi-objective formal character and they are dualistic. Their character, they are characterized by, by the opposition of an abstract general homogeneous dimension and a concrete particular dimension, both of which appear to be natural rather than social. The index of such relations, according to Marx, is value, his category of value, which is also historically specific. As an aside, this immediately distinguishes Marx from Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and the entire tradition of political economy. Marx explicitly distinguishes value as the dominant form of wealth in capitalism from what he calls material wealth, 
which is measured by the amount produced and is a function of knowledge, social organization, and natural conditions in addition to labor. Value, according to Marx, is constituted solely by the expenditure of socially necessary labor time. Within the framework of Marx's analysis, the duality of the commodity form, value use value, generates a dialectical interaction that gives rise to a complex temporal dynamic. Let me begin to elaborate by considering Marx's determination of the mag what he calls the magnitude of value in terms of socially necessary labor time. This term, socially necessary labor time, is not simply descriptive, but delineates a socially general compelling norm. Production must conform to this norm if it is to generate the full value of its products. In the process, the time frame, for example, an hour, becomes constituted as an independent variable. The amount of value produced per unit time is a function of the time unit itself. It remains the same regardless of individual variations or the level of productivity. It follows as a peculiarity of value as a temporal form of wealth that although increased productivity increases the amount of use value produced per unit time, it results only in short-term increases in the magnitude of value created per unit time. Once the increases in productivity become general, the magnitude of value generated per unit time falls back to its base level. The result is a kind of a treadmill. It's a treadmill dynamic. Higher levels of productivity results in great increases in material wealth, but not in proportional long-term increases in value per unit time. This, in turn, leads to still further increases in productivity. This treadmill dynamic expresses and constitutes a new form of social domination. The norm of socially necessary labor time is the first determination of the historically specific abstract form of social domination intrinsic to capitalism it's the domination of people by time, by a historically specific form of temporality, abstract Newtonian time, which is constituted historically, I would argue, with the commodity form. It would, however, be one-sided to view temporality in capitalism only in terms of Newtonian time, that is, as empty, homogeneous time as Walter Benjamin would have it. Once capitalism is fully developed, its temporal forms generate ongoing increases in productivity. These increases, as we've seen, and bear with me, do not change the amount of value produced per unit time. However, they do change the determination of what counts as a given unit of time. The amount of abstract time remains constant. The same unit of time generates the same amount of value, yet changes in productivity redetermine that unit. They push it forward, as it were. This movement is one of time, not in time. Hence, it cannot be apprehended within the frame of Newtonian time, but requires a superordinate frame of reference within which the frame of Newtonian time moves. This movement of time can be termed historical time. The redetermination of the abstract constant time unit redetermines the compulsion associated with that unit in this way, the movement of time acquires a necessary dimension. Historical time here does not represent the negation of abstract time. Rather, abstract time and historical time 
are dialectically interrelated. Both are constituted historically with the commodity and capital forms as structures of domination. This historically new form of social domination subjects people to impersonal, increasingly rationalized structural imperatives and constraints that cannot adequately be grasped in terms of class domination or more generally in terms of the concrete domination of social groupings or institutional agencies. It has no determinate locus and although constituted by determinate forms of social practice appears not to be social at all. I'm suggesting then that Marx's analysis of abstract domination is what I regard as a more rigorous and determinate analysis of what Foucault attempted to grasp with his notion of power in the modern world. Moreover, the form of domination Marx analyzes is not only cellular and spatial, as Foucault would have it, capillary power, but also processual and temporal. The peculiar treadmill dynamic I've outlined is generative of a very complex, nonlinear historical dynamic than Marx capitalist modernity. On the one hand, it's characterized by ongoing, even accelerating transformations of production and all of social life. On the other hand, this historical dynamic entails the ongoing reconstitution of its own fundamental condition as an unchanging feature of social life, namely that value is reconstituted, that social mediation ultimately remains affected by labor, and that living labor remains integral to the social process of production regardless of the level of productivity. The historical dynamic of capitalism ceaselessly generates what is new while regenerating what is the same. As I will elaborate, it both generates the possibility of another organization of labor and social life, and yet at the same time hinders that possibility from being realized. The dynamic generated by the dialectic of abstract time and historical time is at the heart of the category of capital, which for Marx is a category of movement. It's value in motion. It has no fixed material embodiment. Now, if I may, for those of you who know a little philosophy, take a slight detour. I think it's significant when Marx first introduces the category of capital, he describes it in exactly the same language that Hegel used in the introduction to the phenomenology with regard to Geist, the self-moving substance that is the subject of its own process. Now, you don't have to try and get that. But the part that I would like you to get is that in so doing, Marx suggests that Hegel's notion of history as having a logic, as the dialectical unfolding of a subject, is indeed valid, but only for capitalist modernity. Moreover, Marx does not identify that subject with the proletariat, or even with humanity. Instead, he identifies it with capital a dynamic structure of abstract domination that although constituted by humans, becomes independent of their wills. Marx's mature critique of Hegel then does not entail an anthropological inversion of the latter's idealist dialectic, rather it is, as it were, its materialist justification. Marx is implicitly suggesting that the rational core of Hegel's dialectic is precisely its idealist character. It is an expression of a mode of domination constituted by alienated relations, that is, relations that acquire a quasi-independent existence vis-a-vis -vis the individuals, exert a form of compulsion on them, and that 
are dialectical in character. You'll notice, or I hope you've noticed, that the idea of the historical subject, totality, labor, have now become the objects of critique in Marx's mature theory, rather than the standpoint of critique. The understanding of capitalism's complex dynamic I've outlined is relevant, I think, on a very abstract level, to the looming contemporary dual crisis, that of environmental degradation and the demise of laboring society. Marx's categories of surplus value and capital allow for a critical analysis of the trajectory of growth in modern society, which is not the case when they are understood only in terms of categories of class exploitation. One of the implications of what I've outlined is that with increasing productivity, you have increases in material wealth greater than increases in surplus value, but surplus value within the framework of the theory remains central to the system. It means that the system generates accelerating production using the accelerating use of raw materials for smaller and smaller increases in surplus value. So the huge amount of goods produced by this are not really within the framework of this analysis indicative of social wealth. They are apparent social wealth. This also suggests that the form of growth would be different if value were not the underlying form of wealth. That the choice is not growth versus no growth or negative growth, but a different kind of growth. This approach also provides the basis for a social analysis of the structure of social labor and production in capitalism. It doesn't treat the capitalist process of production in, uh, as a technical process that's used by private capitalists for their own end. Instead, it shows that capital molds the labor process itself. That is, it shows production itself, supposedly concrete and material, to be intrinsically formed in its materiality by the abstract form of capital. Yet this process is contradictory. The drive for ongoing increases in productivity leads to the increasing importance of science and technology in production. What is involved here is the rapid accumulation of socially general knowledge, which is promoted by the dynamic of capital. The tendency of this historical development is to render production based on labor time, that is on value, and hence on proletarian labor, increasingly anachronistic. This in turn opens up the possibility of large-scale, socially general reductions in labor time and fundamental changes in the nature and social organization of labor. Now, on the one hand, this possibility indicates that for Marx, the abolition of capitalism would not entail the self-realization of the proletariat, but its self-abolition. On the other hand, because the dialectic of value and use value not only drives productivity forward, but also reconstitutes value, it thereby also structurally reconstitutes the necessity of proletarian labor. In other words, the realization of the possibilities generated by capital is constrained by capital itself. This tension between the possibility generated by capital and the way it constrains the realization of that possibility skews the form in which that possibility emerges 
As a result, ultimately, of the reconstitution of capital's fundamental forms, the historical possibility of the abolition of proletarian labor appears in the form of increases in superfluous labor. In the superfluity of an increasingly large portion of working populations, of increases in the permanently unemployed and the precariat, the underemployed. This development expresses in inverted form the growing superfluity of much proletarian labor. Far from appearing as a linear possibility then, the possibility of the abolition of proletarian labor, and hence the emergence of a possibility of a future in which surplus production no longer must be based on the labor of an exploited class, is at the same time the emergence of the possibility of a disastrous development in which the growing superfluity of labor is expressed as the growing superfluity of people. Capital, therefore, generates the possibility of a future society, but does so in a form that at the same time is increasingly destructive of the environment and of the working population. Note that within this framework, the idea of another possible form of social life beyond capitalism is imminent to capitalist modernity itself within this framework. It's not derived from cultural contact or the ethnographic study of fundamentally different forms of social life, nor is it based on the experience of a previous social order with its own moral economy that is being destroyed by capitalism, although that experience certainly has been generative of opposition. Opposition to capitalism, however, does not necessarily point beyond it. It can be, and often has been, subsumed by capital itself or swept aside as inadequate to the exigencies of the larger historical context. Marx, I'll be a little provocative here, Marx's analysis is directed less toward the emergence of resistance, which is politically and historically indeterminate, than towards the possibility of transformation. It seeks to delineate the emergence of a form of life that as a result of capitalism's dynamic is constituted as a historical possibility and yet is constrained by that very dynamic from being realized. It is the gap between what is and what could be that constitutes the basis for a historical critique of what is. It reveals the historically specific character of fundamental social forms of capitalism, not only with reference to the past or another society or a presumed natural social organization, but with reference to a possible future. The contradiction allowing for another form of social life allows for the possibility of imagining another social order one based on the present while overcoming it. That is, it allows for the possibility of a fundamental critical theory of capitalist modernity. In this way, the theory becomes self-reflexive. It grounds its own conditions of possibility by means of the same categories with which it analyzes its context. few further notes. According to the reinterpretation I've outlined, Marx's theory extends far beyond the traditional critique of bourgeois relations of distribution, that is the market and private property. It is not only a critique of exploitation and unequal distribution of wealth and power. Rather, it grasps modern industrial society itself as capitalist and analyzes capitalism primarily in terms of abstract structures of domination, increasing fragmentation of individual labor 
and individual existence and blind, blind runaway developmental logic. It treats the working class as a basic element of capital rather than as the embodiment of its negation and implicitly conceptualizes socialism in terms of the possible abolition of the proletariat and of the organization of production based on proletarian labor as well as the abolition of capitalism's dynamic system of abstract compulsions. By shifting the focus away from an exclusive concern with the market and private property, this approach could provide the basis for a critical theory of the so-called actually existing socialist countries as alternative and ultimately failed forms of capital accumulation, rather than as social forms that represented the historical negation of capital in however imperfect a form. And there's a whole side of this that I haven't developed and won't develop, but it is Marx's notion that the categories are not only not simply economic, but they are, to use his words, Daseinsformen, Existenzbestimmungen. They are categories that are at one and the same time objective and subjective, social and cultural. Um, and this is something that I think was strongly promoted precisely by the, the Frankfurt School. Uh, I think it opens a possibility of a theory that could reflect historically on the emergence of new social movements of recent decades and the sort of historically constituted post-proletarian worldviews they embody and express. It might, might also be able to approach the global rise of forms of what is called fundamentalisms as populist fetishized forms of opposition to the differential effects of neoliberal global capitalism, new forms that misrecognize themselves as ancient and authentic. I'm almost done. It's become evident, considered retrospectively, that the social, political, economic, cultural configuration of capital's hegemony has varied historically from mercantilism through 19th century liberal capitalism, 20th century state-centric capitalism to contemporary neoliberal global capitalism. Each configuration has elicited a number of penetrating critiques of exploitation, uneven inequitable growth, for example, or of technocratic, bureaucratic modes of domination, or of growing inequality. Each of these critiques, however, is incomplete. As we now see, capitalism can't be identified fully with any of its historical configurations. I sought to differentiate between approaches that, however sophisticated, ultimately are critiques of one historical configuration of capital and an approach that seeks an understanding of capital as the core of the social formation, separable from its various surface configurations. The distinction between capital as the core of the social formation, which I've tried to present here, and historically specific configurations of capitalism has become increasingly important. Conflating the two has resulted in significant misrecognitions. Recall Marx's assertion that the coming social revolution must draw its poetry from the future, unlike earlier revolutions that focused on the past, misrecognized their own historical content. In that light, traditional Marxism, like Walter Benjamin's Angel of History, the Paul Clay's Angelus, Angelus Novus, backed into a future it didn't grasp. Rather than pointing to the overcoming of capitalism, it entailed a misrecognition that focusing on private property and the market conflated capital and its 19th century configuration. Consequently, it implicitly affirmed 
the new state-centric configuration that emerged out of the crisis of liberal capitalism. The unintended affirmation of a new configuration of capital can be seen more recently in the anti-Hegelian turn to Nietzsche, characteristic of much post-structuralist thought. Such thought arguably also backed into a future it didn't adequately grasp. In rejecting the sort of state-centric order traditional Marxism implicitly affirmed, it did so in a manner that is incapable of critically grasping the neoliberal global order that has superseded state-centric capitalism, East and West. The historical transformations of the past century then have not only revealed the weaknesses of much traditional Marxism, as well as of various forms of critical post-Marxism, but also suggest the central significance of a critique of capitalism for an adequate critical theory today. By attempting to rethink Marx's conception of capital as the essential core of the social formation, separate from its surface configuration, I sought to contribute to the reconstitution of a robust critique of capitalism that freed from the conceptual shackles of approaches that identify capitalism with one of its configurations could potentially be adequate to our social universe. Thank you. Thank you. So we agreed that I would field the questions or comments myself. <laughs> so the floor is open. Oh, I need a pen. Does anyone have a pen? Yes, um, I just have uh, two questions. One, I, I found your uh, talk absolutely entrancing, although I'm much too much of a, uh, an economic historian to uh, fully grasp um, um, the whole line of it. But I have, uh, like, I, like I said, two questions. One, uh, when you're dealing with the issue of the treadmill, yeah. um, what relation does this notion have with the much better known idea of declining rate of profit? And what does one say about the fact that uh, contrary to some Marxist predictions in the 19, uh, mid 1970s, late 1970s, the rate of profit um, never declined? And then the, the second question is the issue of contingency. Uh, you can think of many cases where certain contingent decisions were made and uh, certain contingent actions were taken, which were just a blip in the uh, trajectory, but you can think of other cases where uh, certain contingencies happened that seemed to be very fundamental. For example, what might have happened if Lenin had lived another 30 years uh, and had wiped out uh, uh, Stalin and you would have had a conceivably different type of Soviet Union, a different type of real ex existing socialism? Good and fair questions. Um, the issue of the rate of profit, well, is a little complicated. That That is, I don't want, we'll see how far into this I can go. Um, the real movement in Marx's theory is the change in the ratio of constant capital to variable capital. That is, is which is an index, for those of you who aren't familiar with volume one, it's an index of technological change. So the real movement for Marx, the underlying movement, secular, that is a long-term movement, is the increasing importance of science and technology in production. 
In the third volume, which deals with the way things appear on the surface, that's where he talks about the falling rate of profit. Now, the idea of the falling rate of profit isn't Marxist. It's from classical political economy. And the way I see it is he argues to the extent that a falling rate of profit occurs, it's because of the changing organic composition of capital underneath it. However, you'll notice in the third volume, there are many countervailing factors. That is, the rate, in spite of Engels and the Second International and the Third International, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall is not central to Marx is the way I would respond to the first. What is central to him is this transformation in the nature of production that allows for the possibility of a completely different way of social life uh, that would be as different from capitalism as capitalism is from everything that preceded it. Contingencies. Um, it was partially implicit now in what I've, I've just said. Everything that I said was not only pitched at a very abstract level, but very consciously pitched at an abstract level. So when I said these large-scale movements are non-contingent, that doesn't mean that historical contingencies don't occur but they occur on a different level of abstraction. And you have to have, or within the framework of different levels of abstraction, you can have contingencies on some level that aren't on others. Now, the example that you gave, the sort of counterfactual of Lenin, um, I know I'm probably not going to make many friends here, but had Lenin lived for a lot of, for another 30 years, you're right, Stalin and the horrors of Stalinism probably would not have happened. However, that doesn't mean that what would have emerged or could have emerged in the Soviet Union would have been a post-capitalist society, which I think is the only meaningful way to talk about socialism, rather than a parallel to capitalist development. And without going into this in great detail, it seems to me one can talk about the great communist revolutions of the 20th century as being revolutions that allowed certain countries to develop national capital. And they could only develop national capital on the basis of communist revolutions. I think it's the list der Vernunft, it's the cunning of history, uh, that uh, whereas Marx complained about revolutionaries who looked to the past and misrecognized their present, here I'm saying the Bolsheviks looked to the future and misrecognized as a way of misrecognizing their present. Um, so on some levels, I think it would have made a difference, but on the general level, of what was possible, I think it would have been impossible to have anything other than capital accumulation in the Soviet Union. Perhaps it wouldn't have been as terroristic. Uh, that's my response. <laughs> Philip. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, John. Well, thank you very much, Moish. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazingly interesting interpretation of Capital Volume 1. And I want to provoke you by trying to get you to sharpen the position a little bit by dealing with the bits that I think you left out. So here's a caricature of what, you, of what you've said this evening. Okay. You've looked at the whole book through the lens of the first chapter and some of the material at the very, very end of the book. And in between, and this is, this is where I'm going to sort of, I'm going to 
take on the role of traditionalist. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'm the, quite the type the traditionalist you were attacking, but um, I wasn't attacking. Well, just just so di di differentiating yourself from. Um, so here's the sort of traditionalist view that the, the concept of exploitation is absolutely central, and there's this very long argument that runs from. Um, near the beginning of the book to near the end of the book. And it involves the fact that the, that the, member of the members of the proletariat have nothing to give but their labor. Uh, and so they come into a situation where they've got to work for a longer period of time than is actually necessary to make up the material that they will be paid. And as a result, they are exploited. There's no division of this surplus value between them and the capitalists who, who employ them. It's all taken up by the capitalist. And then Marx has a complicated argument about how this situation is going to be increased and exacerbated, and con capital is going to be concentrated in the hands of ever fewer people, and the competition for on, uh, among the labor force is going to get ever more um, uh, sort of intense, and this is going to result in, eventually in a form of class consciousness and the uniting of this group and, the, and then the transition to the next stage. I mean, I think what I've told you is a sort of orthodox story um, in the way it would be recast by analytical Marxists who don't like the labor theory of value. Okay. Right. I mean, Marx would have put it in terms of the labor theory of value. Now, I know, I they mean, remain orthodox. Okay, so what exactly do you make of this long argument and all of the materials that are brought in about the conditions of the proletariat and, and the ways in which the empirical data that Marx uses is supposed to um, do something important. So, that, so it's not really intended as a criticism. It's just, it's just a question. How do, fine. How, 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 do you, how, do you, how, how do you put all this into the framework? Um, the problem is, Philip, that to adequately answer this, I have to walk us through everything that isn't at the beginning and at the end. So, but let me hop, skip, and jump through it. Uh, the second half of what you said about fewer and fewer capitalists and the proletariat bigger and bigger, that's Engels. Uh -huh. That's straight Engels. Uh, and what is called Marxism, traditional Marxism, should be called Engelsianism. Uh, because no one read Marx except for the Communist Manifesto. They read Engels. Kautsky read Engels. Lenin read Engels. Bernstein read Engels. Stalin. <laughs> um, this story misses out on some very important dimensions, also in volume one, which is that using the categories, Marx begins to show how capital seizes upon production itself and transforms it. First you get manufacturing, like Adam Smith's pin factory. Then you get industrial production. And then you get exactly this form of accumulation where the growth of scientific knowledge is much greater. This has been screened out in orthodox Marxism. Um, the problem with the theory of exploitation is not that it's not there. Of course it's there. Of course it's there. Uh, Marx was arguing you don't have to be uh, sort of forced by a landlord to give up 50% of your crop in order to be exploited. That exploitation occurs, but it's non-overt. So all Orthodox Marxists know this. But they don't think about that it's not just a surplus, it's a surplus of value. And they never think about what are the implications of this temporal form. And if you read volume one carefully, that is really the red thread running through the whole thing. Um, which is why the, I forget, did you call them rational choice Marxists or? Analytical. An, right. They call themselves the no bullshit Marxists. They used to. Now they call themselves the political Marxists. Um, they say that you don't need the labor theory of value. 
And they're right if Marx were Ricardo. <laughs> they're wrong because they don't understand what value is about. This is my short answer. So what they can show is exploitation exists, not und. And so we have to end exploitation. So what does that mean? And then you go over all sorts of things. Does it mean the state? Does it mean that the workers collectively decide on their own conditions of exploitation? You run into all of these aporias. Bullshit or no bullshit. They're aporias, is my short answer. Yes? Um, I have another question about contingency. Yeah. Uh, one of your most interesting theses for me um, was that sort of contrary to the post-structuralist critique of Marx, if I understood you correctly, contrary to the post-structuralist critique of Marx, um, Marx doesn't belong to a sort of school of historical analysis that ascribes to history some absolute, imminent, necessary logic a la Hegel, or a la a certain interpretation of Hegel, um, but rather Marx is capable of encompassing the typically post-structuralist critique of uh, necessitarianism in favor of contingency and what have you, um, in as much as your Marx, the late Marx, um, sees the genesis of this notion of the logic of history in the specific, as a, in the specific uh, form of life, or in this form of life specific of capitalism. Right. That's the genesis of this very notion. Um, you suggested, I think, um, that the emancipatory, that the broader emancipatory project of Marxism, as you understand it, is aligned with the sort of post-structuralist crit criticism and discourse more generally, in as much as it aims at bringing about a state of affairs or a form of political economy or a form of life um, that wouldn't be characterized by the kind of necessity or by the or by the determinations that gave rise to the notion of historical necessity in the first place. And my question is whether you really think, or first of all, if I understood you correctly, uh, and second of all, whether you really think that this uh, alternative form of life, we can talk about any alternative form of life other than, other than capitalism as we understand it, isn't characterized by, or couldn't be analyzed in terms of necessity at all, or whether it just lacks the markers or the characteristics that gave rise to the false or falsely generalized notion of historical necessity in the first place. I'm not sure I really understood the question itself. Could you? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so the question is really just about to what extent the notion of historical necessity is, um, hmm. well, to what extent capitalism has a monopoly, as it were, on historical necessity. Um, could you talk, could you elaborate yeah. on the way, on the genesis? Yeah, the because notion? what you've done is you've taken historical necessity almost as a philosophical term, and I'm trying to suggest that what Marx is suggesting is that terms like historical necessity are grounded in a certain form of life, that they don't exist separate from this form of life. So to do it in a, and excuse me if I'm maligning, to do it in a trans-historical philosophical manner, what is the relationship of necessity and freedom, sort of misses the point of what I've been trying to argue. Just as, forget about philosophers now, let's talk about orthodox Marxists. The whole idea of dialectic as being somehow a method, an ineffable method, that could be applied, Engels says, to nature. Lukács says not nature, but just history. The whole idea that there's something out there called the dialectic, the analysis I'm trying to give dispenses with. The dialectic is a feature of the unstable double character of the commodity form. That there isn't the dialectic any more than there is the necessity or anything or anything like that. Does that does that help? It does. It's, I sort of assumed as much. Um, <laughs> I, have, I have a second. I didn't know like, I was that predictable, but okay. Um, <laughs> well, so your, I, the central thought of your talk, um, uh, as I saw it, was this was this 
temporality, this, this treadmill dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, I'm probably not the only one in the audience who didn't really understand it. Um, so I should repeat it? That would help? Maybe if, you could, if, you could, if you could concretize it, I would appreciate, hmm? if you could concretize it, I would appreciate that. Because it seems so... How am I going to concretize something that I've already presented as being an abstract historical movement? <laughs> I know you're not a dialectician, but surely you can give... No, because example. that would be actually false. Mm. To concretize it would be false. You can't concretize it. That's part of the point that I was trying to make. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I'm a medieval historian. Um, I'm a lot less literate than most of the folks who've asked questions so far. But I do want, concretize or not, I want you to talk about the Middle Ages. In other words, um, you said capitalism is different from everything that preceded it. So you're trading there a notion of modernity and pre-modernity. And okay, as a medievalist, I mean, I'll put it, you know, polemically just to you get the discussion going the same way. Uh, anytime, anybody anytime anybody does that, and put, you know, effectively comes up with the notion of, of the modern without spelling out what the pre-modern is, I, I, even if illiterately, I, I get worried. Um, so, so what, so, yeah, where is the Marxist Middle Ages now? Where, where's everything that's before capitalism? How are you what going to talk about that? The what Middle Ages? I, I missed one. The Marxist Middle Ages. What, ah. what any kind, what, anything that's before capitalism, how are we going to speak about that? Only retrospectively. <laughs> I mean that. Look, one of the implications of what I was suggesting yeah. is that there is no historical materialist sweep of history that starts with the Neolithic and somehow becomes ancient kingdoms, becomes Greece and Rome, becomes the Middle Ages, becomes modern capitalism. No. Uh, that the necessity associated with capital is only capital. There is no driving force to history as a whole. The origin of capital is contingent. There is no necessary movement, I would argue, from the Middle Ages to capitalism. The development is contingent, but what certain things fall in place, then you get this machine going, as it were. Uh, so I was setting up a contrast to the, the Middle Ages or ancient Greece and Rome or any other society, and the, the heart of the contrast, and to come back to what I was trying to say about labor, is that it's only in capitalism, and it's not from the beginning, of course, that people reproduce themselves on the basis of selling their labor power or objects that they've produced. That there are no other forms of reproduction. You don't have peasant communes. You don't have other forms of organization that don't depend on labor being the only means by which you acquire your means of subsistence. And in that sense, I think Marx is suggesting that capitalism is so different that in comparison to capitalism, all other forms of society that are certainly heterogeneous can be regarded as non-capitalist, but only with reference to this difference. So I guess the, long, the short story is, I don't think there's a Marxist, there is a theory of the Middle Ages. I think that it is one thing to say that dimensions of life that become overt in capitalist society can be seen earlier, or at least their antecedents can be seen, but that is retrospective history, and that's very different than assuming there's a kind of an imminent dynamic. 
Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, say, you say peasant communities, and so, that, so that I'm worried then we're back basically with the Garden of Eden and the fall story. That there's, there's no, there's... not at all. Okay. What's the fall? The fall is into capitalism. <laughs> Why is it a fall? I tried, I tried my best, even though it's complicated, to indicate that capitalism is this doubled thing. <laughs> It's progress and it's opposite at one and the same time. That's what I was trying to do. And because of that, it can easily be read simply as a story of progress or as a story of, let's go back to, I don't know, when everybody was a singing artisan in Nuremberg or something. <laughs> Okay, um, my question isn't anywhere in the abstract or any of that, just um, uh, as someone who studies history, how can modern society, um, looking back of course at the Cold War and the Soviet Union, um, with the ideas of Marxism, how can modern society shake off the past, the notion that most people have in Marxism? or of Marxism, I guess, because obviously we have the question concerning Lenin and such, and um, I mean, of course, we're all here because we found this topic interesting and whatnot, but in the general sense, it's still a topic that many people cannot even approach because they, they, they find some fear simply in the word Marxism. Um, yeah, how can, the, can society then go from this capitalist realm that we're in um, into the progression that Marx wants when modern Western world is pretty much afraid of the general word and idea of it, or at least in the United States where I'm from. <laughs> and where I teach. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I don't think the issue is the word Marxism. I'm using Marx because I think it's an immensely powerful social theory. Um, I think much more powerful than a lot of people give it credit for being. So the question is what one does to the social theory, it becomes, with the social theory, it becomes secondary if one says this is a Marxist approach. No, it's a critical approach. Try that. Um, I do, don't worry. <laughs> One more question, Moish. Fine. I was fascinated by what you had to say about <coughs> modern global resistance to inequality taking the form of a fundamentalism that's new but that misrecognizes itself as being ancient and authentic. And I just wanted to be sure I understood how that links into what you're saying about the way we understand Marxist analysis really only working in the context of commodity and the in intrinsic instability of, in of commodity. Are, are you saying that this new form that's, that's no longer strict class struggle but rather taking, taking on these new aspects of identity, are you saying that that's moving us into a new kind of stage of, of Capitalism, or just that it's a different way of describing the dynamic? Because it seems to me that you're, you're offering a potentially really valuable way into this question of, of, of non-class-based identities of struggle, if you see what I mean. But I, I just really wanted to hear more about how it works. Um, it's a very tall order, but let me... Let me um, at least begin by saying that I can't go directly from this level of analysis to fundamentalism. That was just a suggestion. I mean, one would have to look at the differential effects, I would say, of neoliberal global capitalism on segments of the world and of, of populations. And I, 
would be very interested in looking at the issue of relative decline and the issue of a certain kind of fundamentalist reaction. And I think that this can take the form of, it can be class-based, the decline of the older industrial working class, uh, which doesn't always have pretty uh, expressions, or whole regions. Um, just for two minutes. There was a very interesting report that the United Nations put out in 2002 that m very few people took cognizance of. It's called the United Nations Arab Human Development Report 2002, written by a whole slew of Arab scholars talking about the catastrophic downturn of the entire Middle East economically for the previous 30 years. You had people, I won't name names or journals or organizations, just regarded this as being somehow a put down of the Middle East. In fact, the combination of really rapid economic decline, serious decline, coupled with, like Syria, had the worst drought for five years, leading to hundreds of thousands of people going into the cities. Um, in other words, I have to deal with a whole number of factors. I just can't read it down from this little talk that I gave. But in both cases, as different as they are, what is a leitmotif is decline. And the question is, how do people respond to decline? And it can be a mass movement. It can be popular. Mass and popular don't necessarily mean progressive. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Boris. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.